Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Byung Hee Hwang from Catholic University of Korea. This is case presentation session one, and we have four great and interesting cases. Our discussant is Shim Him Chung by uh, online, and Sang Chul Jo and Florent Rutsfun Sray. And our first case will be concomitant transcatheter treatment for severe combined aortic stenosis and acute mitral regurgitation. And our case presentation will be Jin Ho Lee from Asa Medical Center, Korea. Thank you for kind introduction. I'm Jin Ho Lee from Asa Medical Center. I'm very glad of this presentation and being the first presenter of the AP Belva 2022. And I hope you enjoy my case. And my topic is concomitant transcatheter treatment for the patient who have the severe aortic stenosis and acute mitral regurgitation. First, I have no conflict of inter interest related to this presentation. <clears throat> In this case, 80 years old male patient come to emergent department uh, with the NIA class four of sudden dyspnea. The onset was two days ago. Uh, his medical history have no specific disease ex except an energy state of prostate cancer. Initially, his mental is alert and vital sign was uh, relatively stable, but the progression of the two requirement and inotropics. The echo finding was the bicuspid aortic valve with the severe aortic stenosis and the severe ML due to prolapse of posterior medial scallop with the coda rupture. So we performed transthoracic echocardiography. You can see the bicuspid aortic valve with the severe calcification and the severe aortic stenosis with maximal velocity 5.4 mm per second and mean pressure gradient as 70 mm mercury. But his LV ejection fraction was preserved. So we for the mitral valve evaluation, perform transesophageal echocardiography. You can see the severe eccentric mitral regurgitation. So, and you can see the pro <coughs> prolapse of posterior medial scallop with the 12.45 is a pizza. In the CT annulus, you can see the very severe crushing chunk to the supra annulus to the annulus. Annulus area is 420 millimeter, and the sinus of bar and the sinus tubular junction is relatively wider than annulus. In the very severe calcium and total calcium volume is 1,530 millimeters. In summarize briefly, the old age patient with a cardiogenic shock status and progression of pulmonary congestion, and Maybe the pressure over the severe AS can lead to the coda rupture and it may make the mitral regurgitation. The main problem is mitral regurgitation. So we need to correction of the two valves. But he is a surgical high risk patient over the 10% of a STS score and he and his family will turn to surgery. So we plan to concomitant transcatheter treatment, TAVA and TER. First, the uh, patient have a very severe calcification and tight orifice. We planned the pre-dilation. An 80 millimeter cement balloon was successfully balloon valvuloplasty. And after that, uh, it can, our tubby valve cannot pass the aortic bulb. It's so tight calcification. So we changed the axis or rotate the hot tubby valve and push it harder, but it cannot uh, possible to the past the aortic bulb. So we change the strategy, uh, tends to cut tabby valve and pull back and stand by at the aorta and pick the catheter to exchange the M plus catheter and try to rewiring. And after, fortunately, uh, wiring was done and we changed the ring torque wire to the Rondakist wire. And you can see the dual valve, dual wire in LV and the balloon valvoplasty at the secondary with the 20 millimeter balloon was successfully. And after that, okay, trans valve can pass the aortic valve easily. 
and successfully implantation of Tavi valve with the 23 millimeter valve plus one cc overfill. After autography, it's just some parabellar leakage was shown, and we one adding the one cc overfill and post dilatation one more, and finally twenty three millimeter tight bell valve with the two cc overfill. And you can see the just successfully implantation of tabi valve, and then we check the intraoperative TE at, at the tabi. And you can see the outer bell function is good and mild, mild parallel leakage was showing. But mitral regurgitation extent is, is, didn't decrease after the TAVI. So we decide to proceed to TER. And first, mitral clip XT at the deploy at the A3 and P3. And in trial TE, you can see the extent of mitral regurgitation was decreased. And after the second clip, deploy at the adjustment at the first clip. And finally, we shown the trivial mitral regurgitation with the transmitral mean pressure gradient with the three millimeter mercury. And array, array pressure is decreased 12 to the five. This is a the after imaging of the two big procedure, you can see the two clip on that and one tabi valve in that. After we follow up echocardiography, you can see that upper side is a pre procedural echocardiography and downside is post procedural echocardiography. Because the aortic valve, prostate aortic valve function is okay and mild parallel leakage. And sorry. Uh, it has some technical problems. Okay. Yes, yeah, so upper side imaging of the pre procedure mitral bulb, you can, and downside adapter, you can see the two mitral clip at the medial side of mitral valve and ML extent to decrease to the severe to mild ML. After that, at the POD1 state, patient vital stable and tapering out inotropics in the requirement. TT findings showed well-functioning prosthetic bulb and mild remnant ML and no evidence of pulmonary hypertension. And we decide to transfer to general ward. So uh, first, the uh, concomitant TAVA and TER is a reasonable treatment option for the patient who have combined acute severe mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis in the surgical high-risk patient. And second, the, if it the hard to trans catheter heart valve past the aortic valve with the severe calcification even through after balloon valvoplasty, Additional balloon valvoplasty after dual LB wiring can be helpful for the past aortic valve. So thank you for your attention. Okay, our discussion will be held after the all cases. And our second case is heart tent syndrome in a young adult Filipino. Case presenter is Laika Maris Balonon Roeka from Philippine Heart Center. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I have no disclosure or conflict of interest. So, congenital heart diseases remain challenged because of the diverse hemodynamic changes um, unique with each case, although rare, it is not impossible that we meet adult patients with congenital heart diseases. So how will we treat them? I am Leica Maris Balanoreca, an adult cardiology fellow from the Philippine Heart Center, and I will be presenting an interesting case of heart hand syndrome in a young adult Filipino. The following will be our discussion points. AN is a 25 years old male, um, 
Filipino single from Manila, Philippines. He was born full term by uh, um, normal spontaneous delivery to a mother whose pregnancy course was uncomplicated. And at one year old, he was diagnosed with pneumonia and a murmur was noted. He was referred to our institution and an echocardiogram revealed patent ductus arteriosus and bicuspid aortic valve. He was advised surgical correction. However, he was lost to follow up. At 21 years old, there was um, easy fatigability on climbing two flights of stairs, but um, no orthopnea or loss of consciousness. He sought consult at our outpatient department where an echocardiogram was done revealing congenital heart disease, PDA with predominantly left to right shunt, bicuspid aortic valve with moderate AS, mild pulmonary hypertension. And Alapril and Sildenafil were prescribed with, to this patient, and he was compliant until one week prior to his admission, he started to have his more progressive fatigability, cough. So he consulted at our emergency room and was admitted. The past medical history, family so history, and social and environmental history are unremarkable. He was alert, ambulatory, with the following vital signs. There was no pallor, cyanosis, or distended neck veins. Noted were by basal crackers. The pa this was the cardiac um, PE. Were noted were left parasternal heave with grade 3 over 6 systolic murmur at the second ICS left parasternal line, radiating towards the neck, and a grade 2 over 6 continuous murmur at the left infraclavicular region. There was no endiba and no clubbing, and all the fingers were noted to be short. A chest x-ray showed cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary vascular markings. There were reticular densities on both lower lobes. Consideration was congestion or pneumonia. The ECG was in sinus rhythm, normal axis, with left ventricular hypertrophy and strain pattern. Hand x-ray revealed brachymetacarpia. So on patients with bicuspid aortic valve, examination of the aorta should also be considered. So HS CT scan revealed a uh, um, dilated main pulmonary artery suggestive of pulmonary arterial hypertension, dilated ascending aorta with dense aortic valve calcification. The 2D echo revealed markedly dilated left ventricle with global hypokinesia. Other findings showed bicuspid aortic valve, moderate aortic stenosis with aortic valve area of 1.3 cm squared by continuity equation and peak velocity of 3.7. The non-coronary and right coronary casts were fused. A continuous mosaic color flow across the main pulmonary artery and descending aorta is seen measuring 1.12 cm with peak gradient of 33 mm mercury. The Computed QPQS is 2.6 is to 1. This 2D echo is interpreted as congenital heart disease with PDA and predominantly left to right shunt. By cuspid aortic valve with moderate aortic stenosis, moderate MR trivial TR, eccentric LVH with normal pulmonary artery pressure. So the complete diagnostic assessment of hemodynamics before any closure is particularly in particularly important in adult patients with PDA, in whom it is imperative to feel fully evaluate the pulmonary vascular resistance and degree of shunting before any intervention. So in patients with elevated pulmonary artery pressure, assessment of the pulmonary vascular resistance and its response to vasodilating agents are helpful. Angiography also defines the anatomy of the ductus arteriosus. The pressure recordings showed an elevated PA pressure of 69 over 46, mean of 56. No gradient across the pulmonic valve on pullback. There was a 27 millimeter mercury gradient across the aortic valve. Oximetry saturations on the right showed significant step up of oxygen saturation at the level of the MPA and RA to RV. There was no desaturation noted. So this cat cardiac catheterization further um, 
concluded that this is case of congenital heart disease, PDA with left to right shunt, QPQS of 4.18 is to 1 with bicuspid aortic, valve moderate AS with systolic pressure gradient of 27 and mild AR, sellers 1, mild pulmonary hypertension and RPRS of 0.04. So there is no guideline on the approach to patients with PDA and with BAV. So our approach on the case was the synthesis of the hemodynamics as well as the guidelines on adult congenital heart disease. Our patient already has LV volume overload as evidenced by the markedly dilated LV with eccentric LVH. And on cardiac catheterization, pulmonary vascular resistance was less than three wounds unit. PDA closure is indicated. Surgical ligation was a more feasible approach to the PD, due to the PDA size and indications for the aortic valve replacement according to this guideline generally apply. It is a class 2B recommendation to proceed with the sur surgical aortic valve replacement simultaneously when another cardiac surgery will be done. So the plan was PDA ligation AVR. Intraoperative TEE showed PDA measuring 1.1 cm with left to right shunt and heavily calcified by cuspid aortic valve with estimated area of 1.4 cm squared. Mitral valve was ins inspected and was noted to have apically tethered leaflets with moderate mitral regurgitation. So this OR technique was done using cardiopulmonary bypass and the PDA was dissected and isolated, then ligated. Posterior LA was opened, mitral valve was inspected, and annular plastering was implanted. LA was closed and aortotomy was done. AV was examined and resected. Mechanical aortic valve was implanted. Decannulation and hemostasis were done. So post-op TE revealed normally functioning, functioning mechanical aortic valve without paravalvular leak and with residual shunt. So six months after this procedure, a repeat echo was done revealing um, increased um, EF from 26% to 50% and the patient was able to return to his job with increased, improved functional capacity. So heart hand syndrome is a broad category of diseases and the presence of any limb abnormalities should prompt the physician to investigate possible associated cardiac defects. The combination of PDA, BAV, and brachydactyly is rare, and the hemodynamic changes is, are important in decision-making for intervention. The current clinical practice guidelines on adult congenital heart diseases and valvular heart diseases should be tailored in the approach to patients with heart hand syndrome. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your nice uh, case presentation. Next case is coil embolization for supraannular rupture during transcatheter aortic valve replacement under extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support. Case presenter is Charyeon Lee from Kemyung University Dongsan Medical Center, Korea. Hi, I'm Charyeon Lee. Uh, thanks for a great opportunity to present my case in AP Valve. Uh, uh, today's case is. Uh, uh, complication case uh, during complex TABA procedure. Uh, uh, patient uh, is 79-year-old female and this year, uh, when she admit uh, our uh, hospital, uh, this year of exception during uh, one month ago. Uh, echo finding uh, showed uh, LV ejection fraction is uh, severe LV dysfunction, 14% and uh, mean pressure grade, aortic valve mean pressure gradient is uh, 67, very severe aortic stenosis. Uh, she underwent uh, uh, mitral valve replacement 20 years ago due to rheumatic mitral stenosis. And uh, mitral valve, prostatic valve is normal function. Chest X-ray is a uh, very severe cardiomegaly and pulmonary congestion, so we uh, uh, intravenous infusion, uh, dobutamine, and uh, IV diuretics. Uh, CT findings showed uh, annulus mean diameter is uh, 28 millimeter, and uh, sinus of Barsalva is uh, all cause uh, or greater than uh, 31 millimeter. 
coronary height is enough. Uh, uh, LC coronary height is uh, 14 mm, RC is 17 mm. Uh, uh, calcium, uh, there is no LVOT calcium and uh, STJ calcium, only um, uh, mainly calcium uh, located leaflet. Uh, uh, calcium score is mainly uh, distribute uh, LCC and NCC. Uh, house build unit uh, threshold uh, 1,290 uh, uh, cubic millimeter. Uh, uh, CT uh, iliofemoral angiogram shows uh, right uh, common iliac artery to uh, common femoral artery total occlusion. Uh, left is okay. Uh, minim uh, minimal diameter is 7.0. And uh, distance of uh, annulus to mitral valve is very short, uh, 2.5 millimeter. Uh, in summary, this case, uh, very severe AS mean pressure gradient 70, uh, uh, 67 millimeter mercury and very severe LV dice function, uh, yep, uh, ejection fraction 14% and short distance of annulus 2 prostatic mitral valve 2.5 millimeter and single iliofemoral artery and uh, very severe uh, valve calcification. Uh, uh, after our heart team discussion, cardiac surgeon, our uh, hospital cardiac surgeon is very aggressive surgical, uh, like uh, surgical correction, but this patient is in operable case uh, because uh, very LB uh, systolic dysfunction and previous mitral valve uh, OP history is uh, make a uh, uh, adhesion in pericardium, so uh, pump time is very longer in this case. So we consider a uh, top approach in this case. Uh, short uh, distance of, if uh, short distance of uh, annulus to mitral valve, increase risk of valve malposition, embolization, deformation. This is previous our uh, experience. Uh, this case is 4.5 distance mitral valve to uh, annulus. After the uh, detachment of our self-expandable valve, slowly uh, um, uh, migrates upper side to outer side. And uh, when, uh, if we choose the uh, self-expandable valve, we choose the uh, Ebola R, uh, Ebola R uh, three, uh, 34 millimeter. Large self-expandable valve uh, uh, have a risk infolding uh, risk. So we, uh, uh, we decision, decide to uh, balloon expandable valve add on to Sapiens 3, 29 millimeter, 2cc on the field and 1.1% uh, oversizing. Uh, this case uh, can occur any time uh, during procedure cardiac arrest. So we uh, prepare all, uh, all puncture line uh, before the general anesthesia. After sedation, we make a uh, right axillary uh, grip uh, uh, for the uh, emergent uh, cardiac arrest and ECMO line. It's a cut down and grabbed and proximal band ligation. If we uh, need the, this line, only uh, cut the uh, band. And if we know ECMO insertion, only lap up and closure, it's okay. Uh, LV wiring, uh, we, uh, and we pre-balloon and we uh, located the device high implantation. After successful uh, valve implantation, uh, one, after one minute, uh, 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 patient vital sign is unstable, as uh, depression, coronary is okay, BP, uh, BP depression. So we review the uh, image of Cine angiogram, slow implantation, but LCC classification uh, can make a rupture in LCC side. So immediately we uh, ECMO uh, insertion and pericardiosynthesis. Uh, you know, all step in this case, uh, we uh, perform the with, uh, cardiac surgeon in uh, uh, hybrid room, we discuss it. But uh, cardiac surgeon uh, still uh, said the 
this case, uh, case is inoperable. So uh, ECMO is uh, uh, after ECMO insertion, uh, patients mean by uh, blood pressure is maintained. So we check the CT. CT show the rupture side in the left coronary cusp. There is no shunt. There is no left main damage. Only supraannular rupture uh, connect the uh, pericardium. Return to cath lab, we uh, uh, tried the uh, out root angiogram. Uh, digital subtraction angiogram very helpful for uh, our procedure. And we uh, decide uh, embolization, coil embolization, O18 system, microcatheter wire, and uh, did not pass. Uh, very uh, LCC calcium make a uh, uh, heavy calcification and angulated root uh, for this case. So we changed to CTO on a O14 microcatheter and wire, filter XT and Caravel, past the region, and we changed the fine cross uh, microcatheter. And then uh, we put the coil uh, O18 detachable uh, ventronic concerto coil. Uh, key point in this procedure, in my op opinion and experience, a very gentle push coil is required uh, because uh, it uh, looks like some uh, aneurysmal vessel, aneurysmal vessel, but aneurysmal change of vessel, but no, there is no, this cavity had no uh, intima, adventitia media. So if we uh, uh, coil the push has, uh, that, that cavity is larger than before. So gentle push and 10 piece of, pieces of coil, we uh, check the angiogram, no dye leakage. And CT scan has no dye leakage and any other problem. And echocardiogram very great, uh, improved the uh, LV ejection fraction and uh, chest X-ray is improved and uh, patient symptom is completely recovered. Uh, many type of uh, annular rupture in uh, after tabor. So first, any type of uh, annular rupture consider uh, uh, definitely consider uh, operation, surgical correction. But some patients uh, uh, has uh, inoperable. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, some uh, case report to show the transcatheter embolization case. Complex tabor can have many uh, complications. In the case of annular rupture, most critical complication, uh, emergent surgical correction should be considered first. However, if the uh, patient is inoperable, it is necessary to consider whether percutized correction embolization is possible. And more research and stu study is needed in the future. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for the great case. Uh, our next case will be post-infarction ventricular septal def defect blockage, direct externalization, and enmeshment to right ventricular moderate band. Case presenter will be Brian Rintoledano from Philippine Medical City. Okay, um, uh, good morning. Um, thank you for having me. I am Brian Rene F. Toledano, an interventional cardiology fellow at the Medical City Philippines. In behalf of my co-authors, I'll be presenting this case. Um, we have nothing to disclose. Our objective is to present a novel transcatheter approach in treating an apical post-infarction ventricular septal defect. Our patient is a 70-year-old female with multiple comorbidities. She was transferred at our institution due to hypotension and heart failure symptoms. On history, she experienced severe chest pain five days prior for which no consult was done. Upon arrival, BP was um, 90 over 60 on norepinephrine drip. A harsh holosystolic murmur and bilateral crackles on both lung fields were also appreciated. Serial 12 lead ECGs showed um, mild S elevation in the lateral with ischemia in the anteroceptal leads, but no interval changes. The troponin I was very much elevated. Conventional views on transthoracic um, echocardiography showed uh, LV ejection fraction of 65%, an apical regional hypokinesia, and a mild right ventricular dysfunction. Aside from this, there was absence of opacification, as you can see, on the right ventricular apex, 
after injection of agitated saline, which is suggestive of left to, left to right shunt, probably from a septal defect. Um, the attending consultant referred her to surgery for VSD repair and revascularization. So, sorry, the coronary angiogram showed LAD mid to distal occlusion and non obstructive lesions in other coronary arteries. The attending consultant referred her for VSD repair and revascularization. However, um, the patient deteriorated on the fourth hospital day. She was intubated and, on, on, and was on triple vasopressor. Um, serial transthoracic echocardiography showed enlarging apical VSD 1.8 to 2.1 cm. Using non-conventional apical views between four chamber and the two chamber views, we were, ab we were able to clearly delineate the apical defect and the left to right shunting. On focus view of that area, uh, Swiss cheese appearance on Doppler is also appreciated. The defect was measured at 2.1 cm. And we also measured the largest diameter of the right moderator band, which is um, 15 millimeter. First of all, the procedure was performed in the catheterization laboratory under general anesthesia, transthoracic echocardiography, and, and fluoroscopic guidance. The right femoral artery and right internal jugular vein were accessed with a 5 French and 14 French introducer sheets. Using a 5 French JR4 catheter over a glide wire, as you can see here, the aortic valve, the LV, and the apical VSD were directly crossed. The glide wire was snared in the right internal jugular vein and externalized to create an arterial venous loop. The system was used to track and position the 12 French delivery sheet across the RV moderator band uh, and uh, VSD and park in the left ventricle. A PDA device 26 by 24 millimeter, which is twice the size of the measured RV moderator band, was used. It was followed at the sheet tip and was partially opened and pulled into the apical VSD and furthermore to mesh with the RV moderator band. As you can see, there's an apple core shape, before, uh, apple core shape which means a well-positioned device in the moderator band. So, um, as you can see in the 3D rendered image, the, the PDA occluder is entangled and moves with the RV moderator band. And this picture highlights the concept, uh, which, is, um, which is deployment of the device in the moderator band. Um, it is coined from one of the authors and the uh, innovator of the technique, which is Dr. Dexter. So um, after which there was sudden improvement of blood pressure and discontinuation of vasopressor, the pulmonary artery pressure actually dropped from 68 over 37 to 35 over 17 millimeter mercury. Um, Transthoracic echocardiography, as you can see on this side, a small residual defect and improved RV function and resolution of TR was also seen. Um, however, patient expired four days post-procedure due, due to intractable ventricular tachycardia and septic shock secondary to HAP, while the PDA occluder remained intact at its position even after cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, let me also share this to you. Actually, this is the first case we did, which survived up to this day with good functional capacity. Though he was a lot younger, at 54 years old, he presented as NSTEMI two weeks prior and had complete revascularization. The post-apical defect was noted actually four weeks prior post-MI due to worsening heart failure and new, and new onset MI. Transthoracic echocardiography, echocardiography showed two small residual apical VSDs. He was uh, actually a good candidate for surgery. However, he strongly refused, hence transcatheter therapy was offered. His 2D echo at one and four years showed an intact um, VSD occluder, as you can see here, and a small residual shunt, but uh, the RV apex became part of the LV. The 
the points I would like to, to raise are the importance of prompt revascularization in late presentations in patients with post-infarction ventricular septal defect, which could potentially limit further myocardial damage and reduce the risk of mortality. And also the major advantage of the Dexter concept is, is that it is independent from disease septal landi landing zones. While the possible drawback is the creation of a neo-LVRV aneurysm, which can potentially cause heart failure and arterial embolism. Arterial embolism. In conclusion, a large complex apical post-infarction ventricular septal defect with no inferior rims, the, using the Dexter concept, uh, it allows for exclusion of the defect and vestigialization of the RV apex, and then an immediate and dramatic hemodynamic improvements can be achieved. That's my last slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your nice presentation. And we have about 10 minutes for interactive discussion. And from our panels, do you have any questions for the lecturers? Thank you for a good and nice minutes and a great capacitation. May I ask a question, some question from the uh, first case, uh, if, uh, with the case uh, with the ethics synthesis and uh, metal regurgitation. Uh, in the patient with the small annulus and heavy calcification, may, the, uh, may if you use the another option of valve that the cell expandable valve, it can be better for the uh, no uh, uh, better residual carrion than this case. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, for the tower posterior, if, if you change the valve to the uh, volume expand to the cell expandable, so that's an overload. It can be the great uh, res uh, no residual carrion than this case. I think it or not. Uh, res, uh, res, uh, residual carrion because the, this, uh, this case is residual carrion is high mm -hmm. because there may be the small annulus and the uh, and, uh, heavy classification. And I think the uh, uh, evolute, uh, uh, evolute prof is a small profile, it can cause the wow easier. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Our hospital experience is more favorable for the sapien three balloon expandable. So, mm. Okay, I have a question for Dr. Lee too. Uh, how much time did it took for doing TAVI and TR together? Uh, maybe on three hour, three yes, hours. Yeah, okay. Four hours. Uh, actually, we had two simultaneous cases of TAVI and TMVR in our hospital. The both patients had double valve replacement. And doing TAVI first or doing TMVR first is a concern. So uh, in your case, why did you do TAVI first and TR uh, next? Yeah. After we had the discussion, maybe the main problem of the, this patient, yeah, first the pressure overloading of the aortic stenosis. And so, it make the cuda rupture and the backward regurgitation. So, if we first try to mitral uh, mitra clip and then LB pressure is not solved uh, immediately. So we first drink the tavar and we solve the pressure overloading and we next go to the mitral clip. Yeah. I am Sang Chol Jo from Yosu Jail Hospital. I want to know what's the main cause of the uh, severe MO. Uh, you said that the cause of is a cordial rupture, but main, I think there is, do you have any coronary uh, evaluation, the kind of any history of myocardial infarction or so? Uh, before the coronary uh, CTF, so no minimal coronary artery disease and 
the patient has no history of the effort chest pain or anything. Okay. And, and in this situation, uh, patients have uh, the uh, to simultaneous disease entities, the uh, aortic stenosis and mitral severe regurgitation. So, uh, valvular uh, depth, insertion depth is more important because the uh, deeply inserted may cause the more aggravity the mitral regurgitation. So, do you? How do you uh, decide to the height, pelvic height? Mm. But, uh, I think that is not uh, okay. Well, Especially the bicuspid aortic valve using the high implantation, so we routinely use it as the routine procedure. Yeah. Okay, Hi. I have a question I, for Dr. Uh, Toledano. Uh, a very great case, and I just have a, a simple question. So you put the device in the RV, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. But is there any pre-angio LV gram before putting the device and after putting the device? Because uh, seeing the LV gram can be a very good uh, point if the procedure was done right or not. Uh, yes, uh, yes, doctor, that's right. But uh, we opted not to do an... Uh, LV gram because the patient, the kidney function of the patient is uh, low and uh, it's deteriorating. So that's why we chose not to do. And we just uh, uh, let the 2D echo guide us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have uh, another question I, for uh, Dr. Cherny. I think it was a very great case. And uh, so how much blood was coming from the synthesis site bef after putting the ECMO and going to the CT because sometimes this case had a very large uh, rupture, but sometimes it's a concealed rupture. So after or five or ten minutes, the, uh, there is no blood coming from the synthesis. Yeah, very good. <coughs> uh, good question. Uh, uh, this patient uh, has a large amount of pericardial uh, pericardial effusion, but uh, we. Uh, first, we uh, after the synthesis, uh, 300 uh, milliliter uh, blood drain, and uh, we lock the uh, uh, drain uh, cartridge. Uh, and <coughs> uh, we uh, after the uh, drain 300 millimeter one after one minute uh, recover pericardial space. Uh, uh, that is a. Uh, uh, Low pressure, uh, uh, low pressure in pericardial space. Uh, that cause maybe uh, previous uh, mitral valve operation make the adhesion adhesion in pericardial space. So uh, our uh, case uh, is maintained uh, after uh, ECMO implantation mean mean blood pressure, uh, uh, but largely. Uh, uh, under a rupture, uh, that uh, uh, after echo in, uh, implantation, uh, vital sign very very uh, unstable, uh, the larger amount of rupture. So, our case uh, successful uh, point is uh, previous uh, adhesive uh, structure is uh, <laughs> possible to this procedure, maybe. And I have another question because. Uh, who did the balloon inflation? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's me. <laughs> did you feel any uh, uh, feeling of resistance? No resistance. No, but uh, in uh, in that case, we all focus is uh, height. Uh, like more very height implantation. There is a slow implantation, and all focus is uh, valve device height. We uh, don't know <laughs> about the rupture. And uh, later, review the imaging. We can check the <laughs> rupture site. So if you do this case again, we'll choose uh, Safian again, or? Uh, uh, I, uh, well, very good question. I uh, don't regret the choice of Safian. Uh, this case is uh, very short uh, mitral and under diameter. So uh, it makes 
더 라지오 마운트 어 파라벨블라 리키스 위 초드 더 에볼롯 알 데르드 노스커트 앤 베리 어 파라벨 어 해버 챈서 파라벨블라 리크 앤 어, I regret the one points. I choose the 26 mm. It's okay, but uh, uh, maybe 26 meter, millimeter is the rupture uh, repeatedly. So 23 millimeter, <laughs> but uh, enters to uh, device very <laughs> big discrepancy. <laughs> it's this case. It, uh, yeah, but I think it was a very great, great case and treated me very well. I have one comment because. You took the surgery for putting the ECMO in the trans uh, axillary artery, right? Yeah, yeah trans yeah, arterial yeah. grept. Yeah, but uh, in our instance, we do direct trans catheter axillary uh, puncture yeah. with no surgery. So if you can do that uh, uh, that procedure, then we can put the ECMO to femur. So I think it's another option too. A very good option, but our our center is have no uh, trans catheter <laughs> subclavian. Okay, great case. Thank you. And we have a question from Shiming Chong from Zoom. Hi. Hello. Hope you can you hear us? We can't can hear you. you. Yes. So, well, I'm Gary Zhang from Hong Kong. Um, I'm so happy to join the meeting. Um, can you hear? We can't hear you. There's can something you wrong. Now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Sorry, can you hear? Testing, testing. I'm sorry. Can you hear now? Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for invitation uh, from the AP WAP. I'm Gary Jim from Hong Kong. So, um, first of all, congratulations to all four presentations. Uh, all the uh, cases are so great and good presentation. I would like to uh, ask a follow-up question to so, uh, the case of coil embolization for uh, annular structure. Uh, actually, uh, I have several experience for the TARFI after mitral uh, post-thesis implantation. So in your situation, of course, you choose the sapien valve. But in my uh, uh, opinion, I think uh, uh, um, the self-expanding valve uh, by e fluid pole or e fluid pole pass uh, should be a better choice because it can, uh, you can retrieve the shift or retrieve the valve if you, you think the valve touching the mitral uh, 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 pieces. And moreover, the um, complication rate of um, uh, self-expanding valve uh, in this severe calcified uh, aortic valve uh, chance of rupture is relative lower than those of a balloon expandable valve. So I think if I choose, uh, I, would, I do your case, I would choose um, a, a self-expanding valve and, and do a, a, a deploy in a very high position and do it slowly in order to avoid touching the mitral uh, uh, pieces and also the, the avoid the chance of rupture. So this is my opinion. Thank you. Okay, great comment. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, we have about two more minutes, but since there are no more questions, so I think it's, uh, I can call the session. Thank you for all pers uh, participating in the AP file uh, summit, and I hope to have a very good day and enjoy. Okay, thank you.